Let's pray. Blessed Lord, who called all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn now to our Old Testament reading. Our reading is from Malachi 3, beginning with verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and all silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulteresses, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. As Aaron mentioned earlier, there are canticles in Scripture, usually reserved for morning or evening prayer. But there's one that fits particularly well with tonight's gospel that he's chosen. So listen to this word of the Lord from Isaiah. The song of Zechariah, I mean from, from Luke. The song of Isaiah, of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He's raised up for us a mighty Savior born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our psalm for this evening. When the Lord over, <clears throat> overturned the captivity of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Indeed, the Lord has done great things for us already, whereof we rejoice. Overturn our captivity, O Lord, as when streams refresh the deserts of the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. He who goes on his way weeping and bears good seed shall doubtless come again with joy and bring his sheaves with him. The word of the Lord. A 
the gospel portion. It's from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Please stand as we hear the words and the good news of the Messiah. Good news according to St. Luke. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of the Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be, lift, shall be filled in and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, in the second at uh, Sunday of Advent, we turn our attention towards uh, the, mes- the prophetic message. In the first week, last week, the message was judgment, that indeed, as we look forward to Christmas and we remember the first coming, we had to contemplate that actually there's also a second coming. But this time now, our focus and attention goes to the prophetic message of the Hebrew prophets, and John the Baptist, who's also called the greatest of the prophets, and to listen to their prophetic call. The prophetic message, if we're honest, is not always an easy one to discern. Sometimes when we read the prophets, they're uh, sometimes talking a little bit about history or some sort of social problem, And then they some then squeeze in a few verses of inspired prophecy and then switch back to something else. It's not always easy to discern. Plus, sometimes these prophets, they're just plain weird. They look weird, they act weird, they look, if anyone came up to you and said, Hi, I've been hearing voices from the sky, you would probably say, Okay, have you have you had your red pill this morning? But the word of the Lord. Now, some of these guys are really popular as well. John the Baptist was very popular. In fact, at the start of the ministry of Yeshua or Jesus, John was more popular than Jesus. His message was powerful and popular. And the message of the prophets were prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord. Well, how do you prepare? Where do you prepare? And here's a good question. Is the message of the prophets still relevant to us today? And I would say, yes. How so? Well, the prophetic call begins, obviously, in the Hebrew Bible. In our portion from the prophet Malachi introduces a messenger. But let's keep this into context. Malachi chapter 2 talked about uh, a very unfaithful and unworthy Israel and Jerusalem, deserving of judgment. But instead of bringing judgment, the prophet turns around and says, the Lord is actually going to send a messenger, a malach in Hebrew, which is also the same word for angel. So messengers could be both human, they could also be divine. The messenger will come who will prepare the way for me. It doesn't say how, but the way will be prepared. And then suddenly, pitom, suddenly, the Lord will appear in his temple. Not in the desert, not in Bethlehem, not in the Galilee. 
suddenly the Lord will appear in his temple. So obviously the temple becomes incredibly important. A strong reference place. That's why our little friend Simeon was waiting there. In, in Luke it says, Simeon, a devout man, was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Where was he doing that? He wasn't doing it in Bethlehem. He was waiting in the temple. Suddenly, the Lord will appear. So Jerusalem, pretty important. And in many of the uh, feasts and festivals of the Jewish people to this day, there are prayers that you pray for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And, if, and when you pray, Lord, speedily rebuild Jerusalem in our day. If you open your eyes and have a look around, Jerusalem looks pretty built already, don't you think? I mean, they're building all the time. The national bird of this country, the crane, can be seen raising up mighty structures everywhere, causing incredibly bad traffic. I think you're done. But no, what they mean is the temple. How can the Lord suddenly appear in his temple if there's no temple? Well, of course, you could take this spiritually, and you could say that we are the temple. Not a problem. May the Lord appear suddenly in your temple. Let's hope our place is clean. And then, interestingly, Malachi introduces another messenger. How many messengers did we read in our prophet today? A messenger will come, prepare the way, and then suddenly the Lord will appear. And then the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, it says, different one from the first messenger, says, will come, says the Lord Almighty. Interesting, isn't it? The Lord Almighty will send the messenger of the covenant. Malach Habrit. It doesn't say which covenant. Is it the Mosaic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant? Is it the new covenant? Is it all of them? Which one is it? But it is a desired messenger. And remember, messengers could be divine or human. The Lord says this one will come. But who can endure the day of his coming, says the prophet? Who can stand when he appears? And King David has reflected on this already in his Psalms. Who can stand before the Lord? He who has clean hands and pure heart. And so he's going to be a refiner, or a, he uses a, a special word here in our English translation, the launder's soap. It's an interesting word, this word for soap. It's not the normal one, which is savon. It's uh, this one here in, in this chapter is borit. It's actually the same word as brit, covenant. So it reads exactly the same. Just change the, the vowels around. Now, where do you find this borit, this this special launder's soap, where you actually make it from the alkaline sea salts and potash from the Dead Sea. So it makes a, a, a very local salt from the wilderness, so local soap from the wilderness, and it's very rough, and it's not exactly smooth, so when you scrape yourself and rub yourself, it's going to hurt. So I'll take some skin off. And here you've got this interesting image that... The messenger of the covenant is going to come. He's going to clean us. Stand before the Lord, clean hands and clean. He's going to take Aaron and he's going to like scrub him up. And it's going to hurt. Because he will purify the Levites. When the Lord comes and he needs to do uh, some cleansing, he will start with the household of faith. Brothers and sisters, he will start with us. It's always an interesting thing. When we, when we pray those prayers and we, and we ask the Lord to come, all during Advent, come Lord Jesus, do we actually really mean that? Are you ready? I remember when I first came to this country in 1998, many moons ago, 
I was walking around the streets of Jerusalem and I went into a bookshop. I like books. And I saw a, a book on sale called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Was Coming in 1988. It was on sale for a half a shekel. Okay? Because obviously everything was wrong. And I'm really glad that Jesus didn't come back in 1988. You want to know why? Because I didn't get saved until 1991. Okay, if you'd met me in 1998, uh, you probably would have said, this guy is he's just not a nice person. He's pretty much broken every commandment that there is in the Bible. And if I haven't broken it, I was breaking it tomorrow. Okay? So there's this tension within even our very prayer life. Come, Lord Jesus, wait. Let the heart give us a little bit more time to get ready. Give me a little bit more time to prepare. Not just my heart, but perhaps some members of my family. Probably we all know family members who are not believers. There are, we probably all know people who are struggling. Some of them might even be us. And would you like, would you like the judge to come now? On one hand, yes. On another hand, let's get ready. Prepare the way. And the prophet, when he's in, in verse 5, when I come, I'm going to set some things straight. And we get all the, the nasty people that are here. He says, okay, but at the end of all this judging, the Lord says a beautiful word, but, but don't fear. Don't fear. I am coming, and my judgment is coming to save Then we, in response to the readings of Scripture in a traditional service, in the morning and evening service, we, we either say a, a psalm or, or what they call a canticle. Uh, uh, Father Darrell explained canticles. There are 21 of them in the Book of Common Prayer. They are Scripture that's been turned into a song. And if you went into a church that had some monks or a, a nice choir, you would get beautiful Gregorian chant. So they sing the Bible back to God. Because part of our prayer life um, is we, we like to do free-form prayers. We like to just pray whatever's uh, our, what we need on our heart. And they're great. But we always have to be cautious and remember and be honest that sometimes we, our emotions might get the better of us. And we might start praying for things that are a bit inappropriate, perhaps not in alignment with the Lord. And so on the other hand, there's always a nice, safe way as part of our prayer life to pray. The very words of Scripture. They're 100% true. So you do both. It's a good foundation and a nice opportunity to go into a prayer from the heart. And so there are these beautiful songs called Canticles. And the one we had tonight from the Song of Zechariah uh, is it's a beautiful song where our friend, he's finally got his voice back because he's, uh, he, the angel had, uh, had, had, the Holy Spirit had shut up his, his voice. He's finally got it back. His son John has been born and he launches into a piece of prophecy. Initially talking about Jesus and then switching to his, to his son. What I would like to invite you to do is to reflect back on this canticle. It's in the first chapter of Luke. When you read it, internalize it. Ask this question. Do I actually really believe what I'm praying? One of the things about Anglicans, for those that might not know Anglicans, uh, why we have a prayer book. Anglicans pray what they believe. That's what's sitting inside this book. We believe what we pray, what exactly we believe. But I want to have a look at some of the things that he says. Zechariah says that we have been saved from our enemies. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. You have saved, delivered us from our enemies. Do you believe that? Do you believe? That you have been freed from your enemy? Do you feel that the mercy of God has indeed been shown to you? 
Do you believe that you have been saved and now are free to worship the Lord without fear? Do we understand our salvation and believe that we are indeed forgiven? And if the answer is no to any of those questions, then during Advent, during this season, as we're leading up to a really good celebration of the birth of the Messiah, then seek the Lord afresh so that you can make those truths of that canticle really yours. And you can understand the, the reality of God's redemption. Those canticles are beautiful, beautiful prayers. Then in our gospel portion, we see that John the Baptist is not hanging out in the temple to prepare the way of the Lord. Where's John? He's in the desert. What's he doing there? I hear you ask. Because he's been reading another prophet, the prophet Isaiah. And this portion of Isaiah, Isaiah 40, is in all four Gospels. In all of the Gospels, we get this announcement. Prepare the way of the Lord, a voice of one calling. So first of all, John is the voice. Excellent. A voice calling where? What's he saying? You see, in, in uh, Hebrew, there are no punctuation marks. So it's not always easy to figure out where sentences start, where they stop, where you're actually supposed to put a pause. And so read this this way. A voice of one calling. Well, first of all, who are the voices in today's world? Who's calling and speaking into our world today? Unfortunately, and with much shame, it's not church leadership. Too many of our leaders... Our leaders of big mega churches and our bishops uh, and archbishops, they speak on things like climate change, which is important. But the gospel is even more important. Or they speak on socioeconomic issues. It's important. But they should be talking about preparing the way of the Lord. Instead, Our secular culture, it has become the voice. And it's taken everything that was once sacred, everything that was once pure, everything that was once holy, and twisted it. And now people just have forgotten the meaning of the season. You've you've known of these these sort of uh these cliches where we're now more interested in presence than the presence. Okay? And we, we know these kind of things, and they're all actually true. And really what we should saying is, who is the voice? And what's the answer? Friends, it's you and me. You and I are the voice. You and I have to be the voice wherever you are watching online. Those of us right here, we have to be the voice to this generation. This world is hurtling toward an encounter with its maker. And the message of the prophet and the prophets and John the Baptist is exactly the same. Prepare the way. Suddenly, the Lord will appear. Are we ready? Are our friends ready? Well, where does this voice call? A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So where do you prepare for the way of the Lord? In the desert. Oddly enough, that's where we get our refiner's soap from. It's where our Dead Sea Scroll people went to go and prepare for the Messiah. The desert, a place of wild animals and bandits, devoid of water, a very dangerous place. Why would I want to go there? Well, interestingly, the word desert in Hebrew, midbar, It's the same word for medaber, which is speak. Where does God speak to his heroes in the Bible? He has them all in the desert. 
when he gets Israel out of Egypt, they're in the desert. Moses goes into the desert. Abraham, Isaac, David has to flee into the desert. Jesus goes into the desert. Everyone is in the desert because that's where God can speak to you without all the distractions, without listening to the other voices that, see, that, that cloud the, the real truth of the message. When you need to depend on the Lord, and when 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 you when it seems like it's it's you're gonna when you you run out of water and you're gonna die suddenly streams in the desert. Or what does that mean for the psalmist? It doesn't rain much in the desert, so how does a stream fill up all of a sudden? It rains in the mountains, where if you're in the desert, you don't see that. But all of a sudden, the water coalesces. And those streams suddenly fill with life. Suddenly the desert begins to get green. How did that happen? The animals appear and drink. And it's all beautiful and wonderful for a moment in time. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Well, how do we prepare? Well, obviously we could prepare individually, yes. We could prepare our heart. You could prepare your hearts. And we could make them clean for the Lord. He who has clean hands and a clean heart. We could confess our sins and go home. But that's not the end of the story. If you knew, you really believed that Jesus was coming. If we really believe that there is a coming of the Lord. Then surely we would be wanting to prepare not just my heart but also the hearts of our families and our friends and our workmates. Do we actually love our brothers and sisters enough to want them to be into the kingdom too? We should. We need to be that voice that tells them and shares the message of hope because there is not a lot of hope in this world. Governments have tried to get rid of the pandemic, fail. Governments have tried to fix up our economies, fail. We've had League of Nations, United Nations, let's bring peace into the world, fail. A voice calling. We need to, to answer that call and be that voice. And we need to prepare our communities and our families and our loved ones for the coming of the Lord. We should start with prayer. Friends, you and I should be interceding and praying for our families. I'm sure each of us probably has friends who don't, don't know the Lord. Pray for them earnestly during this season. And, uh, and may they receive the best gift this Christmas, the presence of the Lord. And we have the opportunity, I guess, also to share to be the voice that speaks hope, light, life. What happens if someone turns around and actually believes us? Are you ready? Wouldn't it be great? Someone then has to, has to disciple. We can't just say, be well, be warm, and go on your way. When uh, the Jewish people heard the good news in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, they asked this one question. It's exactly the same. It's always the same. Now what do we do? No one says, now what do I believe? Because they already believe. They already believe in God. They already believe in the Messiah. Now they believe in Jesus is the Messiah. So now what do I do? So we have to also engage in active discipleship. We have to teach what it is we actually really believe. So friends, this season, as we are preparing the way, yes, start at home, start with it getting our hearts clean, but then, by extension, we need to be that voice sharing light and life and prepare the way in somebody else's heart. In fact, our communities, this community and all those communities that are listening online, should be little incubators of, uh, of, of mission to the world. 
So this season is for a personal set of reflection. Because we actually have an incredible gift to offer to the world. Joy and hope in a very, very dark time. The psalm, Psalm 126, and I was really glad that um, uh, Father Darrell read it from the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, I thought the translation got it right to the world. I'm quite sure that, what that one was. Most of the psalm is in the plural form. Everything's in plural. So we have been redeemed. They have, have, have been delivered. The captives have been set free. It's all in plural, except the last verse. All of a sudden, for no reason, the psalm switches to singular. And it says, he will go out weeping. And then he will return. So this season is Ooh, for a personal set we've of got reflection. ourselves two advents. Here. Because we actually have he will go out weeping gift to offer to the world. Jesus' first encounter Joy with us and hope in a very, very a little dark unkind. Time. The psalm, was it not? Psalm 126. There was pain, really glad rejection, that, um, death. Father Darrell read it. It's also a resurrection. Prayer, uh, and he will return. But this time it says he will return with joy. And he'll be bringing his harvest with him. Brothers and sisters, come Lord Jesus. The Messiah is indeed coming and he's going to bring his harvest with him and that is good news. And we want as many of our family and our friends in with the kingdom as well. So during this season of Advent, let's listen to the message of the prophets. Their message is just as relevant today as it was back then. The voice of one calling. If our, if our leaders won't do it, we will. In fact, you have to. We have to do this and encourage each other together to be the voice in the darkness. We have so much to share with this world. So don't hold back. Not at all. The Master is coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.